Hi there, this is Vicki Ronchetti with Show Dog Prep School, and today I'm going to be talking to my friend Michelle Gorey of Sierra Okami Kennel um, on FSS, or Foundation Stock Service, which I pretty much don't know anything about. <laughs> so I went to Michelle's house one day to look at her Shikoku puppies, and you started you pronounced it. You pronounced these- it right. You pronounced Yay! it right. <laughs> um. And we started talking about this and I realized, well, I knew I didn't really know anything about it, but I mean, I didn't know really how much I didn't know about it and how much there is to it. So I just, I have some questions um, that I want to go through with you. If there's anything you don't know, totally fine. You know, just go ahead and it's okay to say, you know, you don't know if you don't know, because like, I think there's a lot of information um, about this, and I'm sure you know the bulk of what we're going to we're gonna be talking about. But as I mentioned, Michelle has um, Shikoku, also Shiba Inu. So we're going to get to talk to her about how the um, regular breeds and the FSS breeds work together. Um, I just pulled up a few other breeds that you might have heard of that are also FSS breeds. So Alaskan Kleakai, American Bulldog, Australian Kelpie. There is a whole section in the AKC website that you can go and look up all those breeds. Although if you're looking at one already, you probably know that it's in there. So and if, uh, I can insert, and if I can insert here is yeah. um, at an open show, it's not just the FSS breeds that compete. It's the FSS breeds and the miscellaneous. And then some of oh. the regular AKC folks know that at some of the shows, the miscellaneous sometimes are invited to compete. So let's talk about, do you know what the difference is between the miscellaneous and the FSS? Are the miscellaneous just like not in a group yet, but they have like, do you know? Yeah. So, you know, the whole purpose of the foundation stock service is you can kind of imagine it like AKC is the police of the dog world. And pretty much all breeds started this way. This is how they were accepted. So when they first start, they have to be submitted to AKC. They have to submit a standard and they have to have a stud book. They have to meet a requirement to be, um, how do you say, a accepted breed in AKC. So there's a difference between being accepted and being fully accepted or acknowledged. So when Mm -hmm. they first come in, they're in the FSS class. Then when they meet another level of requirements, then they're moved up into miscellaneous. And then when the miscellaneous requirements are met, then they are fully accepted into AKC. And sometimes this can take decades. For example, in Canada, Shikoku was just accepted a couple years ago, and it took about 20 years, a little over 20 years. So does the breed have to have um, a parent club, like a national club yes. in order yes. to do that? Okay. Yeah. And that is one of the requirements to, I want to say that it's the requirement in FSS, but ours has not been on the books and is just now recently legitimate. Um, but in order to move from FSS up into miscellaneous, they have to have 150 to 300 dogs registered in the U.S. Okay. okay. So that's why when they're in that FSS level, it can take that long. And at that point, they are allowed. And to at sit- that point, it's sheer numbers, right? Uh, kind of. Um, they are allowed to uh, register the dog a two-generation pedigree. But once it meets that why they say 150 to 300, because once they meet that um, 300 marker, well, then when they get up into miscellaneous, they're going to be gleaning through all of those registrations and all of the dogs that then don't have, by that time, a three generation pedigree, those are kicked out. And the oh. other the other uh, requirement. Individual in- dogs? Like individual Yes, yeah, just like when you guys submit, yeah, when we submit our, you know, pedigrees um, to AKC for our regular fully accepted, because mm-hmm. they know that some of these dogs can be foreign and it might ha- be challenging to track down records for a short time, they will accept two generation, but that once it gets up into that level, um, then they need to all be three generation. And so that's why 
it then can take a while again to get up to that 300 mark of three generation pedigreed dogs registered with AKC. So that's why there's that um, uh, kind of a window. I'll give you an example. About eight years ago, yeah, eight years ago, I hosted a friend from Hungary with her Shikoku. And um, she spoke to us, but the language barrier, she asked me to register her dog for her. And when I registered him, you're not going to believe what number he was registered in the U.S. Number 10. Oh, my God. So my heart sank. And I told, I was telling myself, this might not happen in your lifetime if they're only at number 10. How much do you really love this breed that you're going to stick with it? And sometimes it's a matter of, you know, you're not able to show your dog as much as you would in a regular breed. And I had that to go off of having a start in Sheba and understanding how the AKC shows work. And right. so now we are about 230. So we, wow. have, we have the numbers, but now what it is, is unfortunately, it, it seems to fall back on politics because mm. one of the requirements um, when to move up into miscellaneous while the breed is in FSS, 10 of the parent club members have to have a certificate merit, certificate of merit on a dog that they are listed as owner or co-owner. So a certificate of merit is like a championship to us. So perhaps some people aren't interested in their breeds becoming That's AKC right. registered. Is you that true? Okay. I didn't say it. But, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, so sometimes the the breed club, they don't want people in their club that show dogs. Right, right. Well, I remember, I feel like I remember when the Border Collies were getting introduced. I think there was a big thing, like, and I think that they were concerned that it would change the quality of the animals and the working, you know, um, integrity of the dogs. So, yeah. I mean. And, the, and there's um, a way, there is a way around that. You know, and it's, it's unfortunate, yeah. and, you know, here for an example, uh, what's, I'll talk about something positive is um, the uh, Japanese Akita, what we call the Akita Inu. It just this past year moved up into miscellaneous and they worked together really hard. And I believe they got it done within just a few years because they had been working on it behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And then what they were allowed to do, it's kind of sounds strange. Um, there's a write-up in one of the dog magazines in the FSS issue is they were, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wording it wrong, but they, uh, the American Akita um, Kennel Club allowed them or agreed that, yes, you should separate yourself and, you know, apply for your own, um, you know, FSS and miscellaneous. So they moved up uh, really quickly just within a, a couple years into miscellaneous. And that's wonderful them. I'm always happy when I see a breed moving up or fully accepted and I see these people in the ring, I make sure I congratulate them because I know the hard work and the sacrifice it takes. It's a lot of advocating right. for your breed. It's a lot of breed education. You don't know how many times I've shown up at an open dog show and the ring stewards or the judges and even sometimes the AKC rep, they don't know how these, these shows are supposed to run. And so you're actually, in some cases, you're teaching them. You know. So tell me about how and where you show your FSS dogs. The farthest I've traveled is Oregon, Southern California. And then but I they're also... at AKC shows. Yes. Sure. So yeah. an open show, it's a completely separate show that runs alongside a regular AKC show. So okay. at some of these shows, you know, I'm going in the ring you know, multiple times, maybe, you know, three times a day, just in the breed ring before my Shiba and my Shikoku. Right. And so that, that can be, that can be juggling. Um, so the point structure is different. And I, I'll say in some ways it was more confusing for me because I'm used to the AKC regular show point structure and right. you know, majors and point, you know, points carry over and all of these type things. In a way it's simple, but 
it, it it's challenging and even i have to at times look it up and count the breeds of dogs and so first of all we don't need majors so that's good no majors okay it is 15 points so for a certificate of merit a dog has to earn 15 points okay. and it's the point structure that is different okay and the way that works is at an fss show there's two groups there's the fss group and there's the miscellaneous group okay i'm writing notes <laughs> yeah and um so the way you can get points is you can get a point in your breed ring if say there's a male and female dog and say the female beats the male the female got a point so you can get a point for um um for best of breed just by beating one dog so you can get mm -hmm. a point that way then the point structure it's not you don't need as many you don't need to beat as many dogs to get a point to get to get points but the most that you can get um in the um the group the group level would be five so so let's you, say you let's say you energy your show uh here let me break it down real quick okay. if you beat, if you beat two dogs you get one point if you beat four dogs you get two points if you beat eight dogs you get three points if you beat 12 dogs you get four points if you beat 16 dogs you get five points Okay, so, so even I, I'm, meaning, I'm staring at it right here. I have to look it up. It's not like it's not even mathematical. It's like it starts mathematical. Two dogs, you get one. Four, you get two. I'm like, oh, that's and good. then it just goes crazy. Going. Like, no, it doesn't work. Uh -huh, out. And then it does its own thing. So, yeah. so, but that includes the FSS and the miscellaneous. No. So there, no, here's where it gets a little crazy. Here's okay. where it gets crazy. Okay, is if you win the group. Okay if you say you win the fss group and you get group one you will only get point you don't get any points for group two group three group four you don't get any points on okay. that you would only get points on group one and that's where it switches it's not based on how many dogs you beat it's based on how many breeds you beat isn't that bizarre mm -hmm. that threw a lot of us for a loop so and not individuals not individuals. No, first thing, it's, right? It's right. And it so, goes yeah, from it, individuals it to okay. Right. So then you have another opportunity then to um, win points. If you go further, if say you uh, get a group one, and so there, there's always going to be two dogs in the best in open show ring, right? It's going to be your op your miscellaneous and your FSS going head to head. Okay. And um. So then it switches again. So then if you win best in open show, then it switches back to the points based on the dogs that you beat, on how many dogs you beat. Of all breeds? Of, of number of dogs, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Wow. I know. Wow. So you, but the only way you can do this is at an AKC open show, obviously they're, they're, they're oh, just always a club can choose to offer an open show. This is interesting because you know, I'm on the board of a club and yeah. we were just talking, we just did a meeting about our show and, our, yeah. and they said, you know, we're going to have an open show. And so this is really like interesting to me because, you know, I, it, it's very different. I'd love and to so help it's you usually with that. just in a little room, right? It's just like, it's just like in a little room someplace else or like another ring. No, it's just it's has its own like, ring. Um, and, Sacramento Kennel Club, we were right there in the main ring with with every so it's it's sometimes it's it's kind of like viewed as owner handler at times. Um, OK, the other way we can show our dogs, and that is how I got an early start on the mail that I just finished. Um, Daito, I started showing him as soon as I can. I was able to show him in the beginner puppy class. And I love that about AKC because then it also gives us an opportunity to give early exposure to our little puppies and so, so it does it's not an f it's not an open show beginner puppy it's like they just right in the, the regular, regular beginner yeah. puppy. 
Nice. Yeah. Oh, that's and it really throws nice. everybody for a loop because then we are, you know, then it's like, you know, hound working toy. And then it says FSS. People go, huh? What, what's FSS group? Yes. <laughs> um, so. I want to ask you, how do you feel like, how is the quality and the consistency within the FSS breeds? Like, cause you, I love that you've come from a purely, you know, recognized breed to this other breed. So you have experience in, in both breeds, right? So do you, is it like just all over the place because they're so new and they look very different? Do they, do they have a lot of consistency in breed type or how, how do you find that? Or do you just not see any more of the same dog because there's so few that you just don't know? Well, for now, our judge, we do not have, see, that's what I mean. You know, we really don't have our it together. Um, right now, the judges go off of the stop. The judges go off of the FCI standard. So the European, so the Shikoku, the Shikoku is fully accepted in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so judges use their standard because we really don't have a standard yet here in the U.S. with AKC. Our club, that's one of their responsibilities, is they need to come up with that. Okay, okay. So, and who are the um, judges for the FSS shows? A lot of them, they do their homework ahead of time, and I find that I'm the same way. I do want to go back and answer that question of you. Uh, that you had is oh yeah and you know i'm kind of a purist when it comes to these japanese breeds <laughs> i gotta say i mean you know vicky did an amazing job evaluating my litter and what she went off of was the japanese translation of what the what we call nipo the pure japanese breeders in japan are looking for and i'll explain nipo is um, the oldest um, dog organization, preservation organization in Japan. And they were the organization that sta saved the Shibas from becoming extinct after World War II because of all the bombings. And they didn't have many of the Shiba left in the city. So they took some from the mountains and they combined it. And so, you know, we're, we're fortunate that we do have them. Um, so what we as... <laughs> As, Ni, as Nihon Ken or Nipo uh, enthusiast is we try to stick to the Nipo standard. And it's the same, it is the same with uh, Shiba. Is that's mm -hmm. the, the true uh, Shiba is what is in. And, and judges have their preference. You know, there's kind of like the American, the AKC preference, and then there's the Nepo preference. And there is kind of right. you know, a different type. They're both correct, but it's a different type. Mm -hmm. and, and so that really is up to the judges, like what, how they translate it, like, or how they interpret it, just like with, you know, pretty much every breed and breed standard, right? Right. right. And it's, but, it is, it's, it's, it's fun educating them because the, the FCI standard, it's very just generalized it does not have a lot of detail to it like say like the Shiba um, standard and so mm -hmm. I really enjoy educating them and especially um, at one of these last shows when I was in Oregon where I had both a male and a female and you know you bring the male in first and like oh wow look look at his head look at this look at that and then I bring the female in and they're blown away they say wow the eyes the expression and then i don't mind right. you know it's kind of a matter of really understanding your breed and going over the details of the the japanese standard with them the correct eye the the deep set eye the you know the the ear pitch the shape and the differences and they'll sit right there and they'll look at the boy you know in the in the crate and they'll look at the girl and and so i enjoy educating them and it at every show i go to i always bring like a little trifold about the breed that goes into detail. Oh, nice for the judges. Yeah. And, oh, and people awesome. ask. Yeah. Yeah. I love ours. that. How do you like showing um, FSS breeds compared to showing um, a completely re AKC recognized breed? You know, it, there is with the shows, 
to me, there's more of a camaraderie. But then again, you know, you get out of it what you put, put in, you make it what it is. And one of the things that I do is the night before a show, I'll double check and I'll look up the different breeds that I'm going to be seeing the next day. And if it's something new, I'm like, oh, wow, you know, and I'll read up on it and what, mm -hmm. you know, what's the purpose and uh, where it's from, you know, is it cross with any breeds? And then when I see them ringside the next day, I'm like, hey, that's that dog. And it's, is this true about them? Da, 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 uh -huh. you know, and, and they love that, that you take as a competitor, another exhibitor, that you've taken the time to show interest in their breed. Because, you know, we're all there for the same reason. We have that same passion in each of our breeds about bringing something new to the table, about having something that we, that we really love. We feel it has a lot to offer. And to me, it's because it's, you know, it's kind of a small little group. Typically, the the biggest show mm -hmm. I went to was um, Del Mar. Uh, was it no Silver Bay? Yeah, in Del Mar, mm -hmm. the near San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, that one where there are about thirty two dogs. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty total, crazy. Total, and it was pretty cool. Um, on one of the last days, the uh, best in show uh, judge. She she's. Uh, also breed judge. So she breeds um, Akitas and also mm -hmm. Shibas. I didn't know that about her. She did on my research, but it doesn't really matter. So what was cool is that on um, one of those shows, because some, many times it's two shows in a day, you have a morning open show and you have an afternoon open show. Mm -hmm. And it's we, those of us that are involved, we actually recommend that to the clubs. If, if you're going to be, um, you know, hosting it and you're going to do a Saturday, Sunday, if you offer two shows in a day, which you can, you would, you would get a lot more people showing up to get those points. Um, okay. So in, um, at, at uh, Silver Bay, her, um, best in open show and I, it's kind of reserved best in show but uh, we had the Akita Inu and the Shikoku mm -hmm. and so um, I asked the owner I, I know the owner of the Akita and the judge and I said hey you guys you know you want to do a kind of a, a dual win photo and uh, the club really enjoyed that and what I try to do is before everyone leaves get everyone together for a group photo of oh, all nice. of our FSS and miscellaneous, um, a FSS miscellaneous discussion Facebook group. And so there's that um, involvement that we have. Oh, there is? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. A great place. So people could probably search that, right? That's a great place to host your show, to announce your show. Okay. And what is that group called again? It's, um, I believe it's FSS and miscellaneous discussion group. Okay. And then how many on average shows are there in compared to like how many, what percentage of AKC shows that you go to offer open shows? You know, I was thinking about that. I had a feeling that was a, that was a, a question <laughs> um, that I was going to get asked to. Well, um, during COVID. Okay. I mean, I didn't really calculate, but what would you say, like with our regular breeds, did we go like a year, year and a half, not showing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did. I did. Yeah. I did so for sure. For, for us FSS breeds, we went two years without showing because wow. they were, you know, kind of on the tail end, they weren't being hosted, you know, right, right before this is going right. on and they were very slow to start back up again. And then when they did, there were almost too many shows to go to, which I was there very thankful for. Yeah. Um, and I always also instill in others and I remind them because a friend of mine, um, she um, was asking me um, information, you know, advice on how to host their first open show and um, about the draw and, um, you know, the rosette colors and all of that. And it's all broken down. It is, it is different than the regular shows, those, mm -hmm. the, the rosette colors. And 
from what I could tell and the way she explained it to me, you know, it cost the club money to um, have, you know, the judges there and the judges extra time and that ring time and then the right, the, the hotel, the travel, all of those things. And some of the attendees, the other exhibitors at these shows, they explain, oh, they didn't know what to do with the rosettes and they did this and we had to wait for that. And, da, da, da. and I said, you know what? I said, did you know that the clubs lose money unless they book, unless they're able to have an entry of about 30 dogs or more at an open show? And so I said to them, I said, you know what I do at every open show I go to, I make sure I bring my dog or dogs and I go up to that superintendent desk and, and I speak to some of the, find out who the club members are. And I personally thank them for hosting that show and how important yeah. it is and what it means to me. And because again, we went two years with news. Right. And it's a learning process for all of us, you know? So, so the, do the judges have to be, because I mean, I have had people complain to me that like they feel like the judges didn't know the breed at all. But because could it could it be like it is for let's say national owner handler series where maybe the judge is not approved to judge a group, a regular variety group, but they are they can judge an owner handler group. Do you know what I mean? So is it like no. they don't have to go through the process of learning each breed like an No, judge? no, actually for me it's been the opposite. And almost every time that I'm up there um you know at this at the at the ring steward's desk I could see that the judge has taken the time to print out the standards and they're sitting right there on the table. And so mm -hmm. they know what dogs are going to be there the next day and they're brushing up on them. And yeah. then for me, it, it, you know, warms my heart when I bring the dog in the ring and to give you an idea, um, for Shikoku, there are nine certificates of merit in the U S so then that's, that's like nine champions in Shikoku. Wow. That's all. Okay, so I'm trying to do is explain the rarity of the breed for right. the judges to see them. And I've had even people come up to me, uh, Japanese people, and they come up and they're like, oh, is that a Shikoku? I'm like, yeah, how did you know that's a Shikoku? Yeah. Like, oh, I lived in Japan 40 years. I've never seen one. And that's another thing is that Shikoku are of the Japanese breeds. They are the rarest in Japan. So to me, it's, it's a great honor. It gives me a lot of pride to be able to represent this, this rare breed. And so when I walk into the ring, a lot of times these judges, they'll say, I've been so excited to meet this breed. Oh, I, when I saw this, I was so happy I could finally meet this breed. Oh, that's it's awesome. Amazing. I love how that. Many, how many judges have never put their hands on this dog? And then I always make sure I tell them that, you know, and they, they read it as well, that, you know, it's a big difference temperament wise between Shiba and Shikoku. It's like having no, a real I didn't dog. ask, I didn't ask you about this before and we don't have to go into it, but okay. I remember you talking to me at your house about the situation with your breeder and how difficult it is to get a hold of this person because they truly are like not someone who's online, not someone who's by a phone and that, you know, you really have to. Oh, my, my breeder in Japan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like somebody so, has to ride a bike up a hill. Yes. And yes. yes so, a you know, and, so I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I, um, I've, I've owned Sheba's for 23 years. I've been exhibiting for 12 and I really took my time and focused on being mentored in education and putting multiple titles on my dogs and, you know, champion, grand champion, bronze grand champion. I was doing that um, for nine years before I had my first litter. You know, so mm -hmm. I really focused a lot on education and being mentored. And I'm glad I did because I have one of um, 
the, the best mentors in the country and in Japan. She's a, a Japanese friend of mine. And uh, she helped me import my first Shikoku from Japan. And um, in fact, she just recently, she uh, invited me to go with her to Japan for the big Nippo Grand National Dog Show. And if it wasn't for the fact, and she knew too, is that it's in November that I'm doing some, you know, really vital breedings then. So we're looking at next oh, year. But to me, okay. it, that it's such a huge honor, such a compliment. My my camera just kind of went dark. Can you um, hear it me? It for just a second, but I can still see you. And oh, I can okay. hear you okay. Okay. I can't see you guys. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, for the, for the, uh, the, the, the way the culture is, uh, it was just such a huge honor for her to invite me and then uh, help me also select a new male, you know, meet the breeders and select a new male puppy for our kennel. And she would also, you know, use the male. Um, so the the breeder of one of uh, the girl that that uh, she helped me import, he's uh, 80. Well, now I guess he's like an 89 year old gentleman and he's a also a Nipo judge, and he's one of the oldest Shikoku breeders, and he lives on the island of Shikoku, up in a little uh, village, up in the mountains, and he doesn't have internet, he doesn't have cell phone or, or uh. email uh, or smartphone, any of that, and so um, you know, he's, re he's reachable by phone, but I, I can't speak to him. So my, you know, my mentor speaks to him for me whenever <laughs> I have a question. And that, so for a while, when my, my girl, my, that's her name, when she was doing so many wins, a friend of ours there, he would literally like print out the photo of the win and he would get on his little motorcycle and go up in the mountains and hand it to him. And there was a, a so few, amazing. a few times where she was just, you know, win after win after win. And I didn't know he was doing that. And so my mentor said to me, Oh, so-and-so he says, you need to slow down. He just went up there. You're having too many wins. <laughs> too many bike rides up the hill. Yeah. 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 Okay. My final yeah. question is, would you encourage or discourage people from getting involved in an FSS breed? Let's say someone's like, I really wanted to get into showing and I really love Shikoku. Yeah. <laughs> you know, would you be yeah. like, uh, you might want to start with an AKC breed if you really want to get in there. Yeah. Or... Because you would, th right. You would think that, um, getting into a new breed that there's less politics, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I read, I read a lot of these dog magazines that got some really great articles. And the question was posed in this article is, what is your opinion about all these new breeds coming into AKC? And you had these, you know, all across the board, people are saying, oh, we have too many already. We don't need another breed. And, and what, are, you know, it's just this mixed with that. And, and I hear that ringside. So <laughs> I do hear that ringside and our breed, thankfully, you know, they date back 6,000 BC. So they're not mixed with anything that maybe just wild, you know, wolves and foxes. And, um, but I, I overhear some of the regular dog show folks who I know and who are my friends and they're standing ringside at the FSS breeds and they'll just go, ah, that's just a, this mixed with a, that, you know, and, and the, the, the disappointment on folks face, I look at it this way is that sometimes the breeds that we have they don't always meet the needs of the public as a pet or for everybody as a breed. And I'll give an example. Um, Shebas, they have a very low desire to please the master, right? They're like cats. <laughs> it's kind of like, come, That's an understatement. Come, you know, come, come to me. And they look at you and go, yeah. <laughs> on my terms. So what one of the what are the one of the traits that I loved about Shikoku is they have a desire to please the master. They're, they're jovial, they're hound-like, they're friendly with strangers, they're not aloof and standoffish. And so when I was reading some of these traits, um that's what got me all fired up about the breed and I find them more trainable uh than Shiba. They're easier. Mm -hmm. They don't have that kind of persnickety, uptight, type A personality, that kind of fastidi uh -huh. fastidiousness 
they're more yeah. easy going and um it's just it's nice it's nice around to have around the house it's just easy um there's a, a little breed that that makes me think of this is people were uh, it was the, I think it's the Danish Danish farm dog or Danish Swedish farm dog. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it looks like a maybe a little stockier Jack Russell with the darker spots and more of a more smoother coat. I mean, you could. Yeah. I'm just describing what it looks like. I'm not saying that that's what the breed is, but I love the way they describe it as it is an unterrier terrier. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so it's you know maybe maybe aesthetically that breed isn't bringing something new to the table, but, or maybe it is, but then also maybe, wow. you know, people don't know the temperaments like our dogs. They do look different than Sheba's. The temperaments are completely different. And so right. I think it's nice to have, you know, another option. And there are breeds that are more popular, more FS. There are FSS breeds mm -hmm that I find that are more popular with judges. Um, mm -hmm. I see that sometimes if, yeah, if a breed does look similar to something that we already have. Um, yeah. I've noticed kind of the trends. Well, and I mean, it's, it's, it's not only about, I mean, like filling a niche, but also it's the preservation of those breeds. Like people care about those breeds. Right. So it's, it's like, for you, you're not just saying, you know, I mean, this is a breed that's been around for a long time. This is yes. an old breed. Only 6, so it's like, BC, yeah. Right. So it's like, yeah. and I'm sure a lot of them are old breeds, you know? Well, so it's be, like, you to, 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 the, the point is the preservation of those breeds. Why don't those breeds, those breeds should be preserved just as much yeah. as more popular right. breeds already, right. you know? like right. And, breeds. right and with Shikoku it is literally preservation and the rarity um one of the the breeds that we had at the last time um and I looked it up the night before I was really amazed and had a cute little story that went with it I now I need to look it up what it is it's a breed that it just started like in the 1940s and it it looks kind of, it's like a bigger version of a Padango. Um, a Moxie, um, uh, and now I need to look it up. And so the story behind this breed is that there was a little dog and it was a mascot of the U.S. Army troop during World War II in Germany. And it would hang out in the camp with, with the soldiers and then when it was time to ship out, they lost the dog. They couldn't find it. So I believe like a French woman found the dog and she bred it with some other just like purebred of a terrier, almost terrier type. And all the puppies looked identical. And there you go. There's your new breed. That's when it started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they just kept it bred everything from those two dogs. Yes. Right. And so that, so, so, you know, you, you, sometimes you would think that some of these breeds go back in hundred, hundreds of years and sometimes they do. And then some you get that just started in the forties. I read something new about um, the American Akita and the Akita Inu, and it's just mind blowing. And it, it is a wonderful example of just how recent some of the development and the, the advances and how, um, you know, aggressive, the, um, not in a bad way, but how quickly and aggressively that they could change a breed. Um, we all know that there's a huge difference between the American Akita and the Akita Inu. Now in Japan, the American Akita is not accepted in Nipo. I don't know if it's accepted in the JKC, the Japanese Kennel Club. I, I would doubt it. I wouldn't think it would be, and I'll explain why. So when we started to get the uh, Akita, I'll just call it the Akita, here in the U.S. was in the 1950s, like Helen Keller was given one as a gift, okay? And of all of the different breeds and variations, and you wouldn't believe it, but the, the Akita, the Akita Inu, was bred with some like hound type breeds 
they were trying to strengthen mm -hmm. the health and these things. Okay. And so by, by the 1950s, they were still developing it. So we got the 1950 version of the Akita Inu. We got what they left off, where they left off in the 1950s. So then they continued to evolve it. They wanted it to look, the Akita Inu, Japanese Akita, they wanted it to look more similar to the Japanese type spitz look. And I would imagine that with the color marking that they must have bred in there somewhere with a Shiba because it's got that same mm -hmm. color. But I, yeah. I found that so fascinating that here it was the 19th and then they kept going. And then it occurred to me then all the images that I'd seen of Hachiko, a dog's tail all the old 1920 photos, you know, the dog, the Hachi, the Akita that waited at the train station. Yeah. When you, when you look at those old photos of him, he looks more like the big boned, you know, wide muzzled squared head bear kind of a head. He looked more like an Akita, American Akita than a Japanese Akita in all the images mm -hmm. of him. It's all, all white. I believe I just found that so fascinating in the, just in the involvement of breeds and you know yeah. what what we're doing. Wow. Anything you want to add about your beloved FSS breed? <laughs> um just if you know it it's kind of I want to remind everybody that all breeds started out this way. They're beloved breeds that they owned themselves. Mm -hmm. They were all at one point, you know, in part of the FSS uh, groups and um, it is hard to find shows. And when the, when the shows did start back up, um, I was doing about a show every other month and sometimes one a month. And now I noticed that, you know, shows that were around last year, they're not, they're not this year. Two of them have, mm -hmm. that I've seen have dropped off. And then I also noticed okay. that one of our UKC shows dropped off. So it's, it's fortunate. I, I'm allowed to allow it, I say allowed, like like we're being condemned <laughs> for the redheaded stepchild. You know, I'm allowed. I show uh, my dogs in uh, IABCA, UKC, and uh, AKC open shows, and um, it's been a really a, a wonderful experience to um, to share, you know, such a rare breed with, especially the judges who've been who've been wanting to see it and who hadn't, um, but it would really be helpful if um, those of you who are club members, if you know, you could encourage uh, your boards to consider uh, hosting an open show alongside and get the word out and you get the attendance. Two, if out. possible, right? Two a day, two yeah. Do yeah. Two a day, yeah. you can do one in the morning and one in the afternoon and, and get your entries up that way. And, um, uh, my friend in Southern California, uh, Karina, because she usually brings quite a few uh, Shikoku and I bring mine. She also um, usually sponsors their entry. And so that helps also is oh, when wow. clubs, you know, when when breed clubs can sponsor entry for the club. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So awesome. Thank you so much for talking to me about this. Oh, I really you. appreciate it. you answered so many questions for me and I really encourage everybody to take a peek. If you're, you know, even if you're not interested in, in FSS breeds or any of the breeds in there or showing there, you know, just maybe show your support by watching if you can, by, you know, we all have breaks most of the time in our dog shows, we can run yeah. over and just hang out at the open show ring yeah. for a little while yeah. and, and, and maybe, and, and maybe hold off too. saying, you know, and hold off saying, Oh, well, that looks like a, this bread with a bat instead say, yeah. so what it's, so what is unique about your breed? Tell me something unique about your breed. I'll tell you something yeah. unique about my breed, their tail. It's prehensile. They can move. Shikoku can move every joint on their tail. Like they can wag just the tip of their tail. That's a trip. Like a fox, right? A fox has a pre uh -huh. tail. Yeah. So cool. So cool. Uh, well, thank you for doing thank this. Thank you so I'm much. Glad I could Let's be a part talk of again it. soon. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Thanks again, Bye. Michelle. Bye.